In the last lecture, we talked about the electron configurations for the elements hydrogen through argon, which comprise the first three periods of the periodic table. Now we're going to discuss the electron configurations for the rest of the periodic table, that is periods four through seven. In particular, we'll talk about the relative stabilities of the orbitals in these periods, and look at the electron configurations for elements starting with potassium. As you'll see, there are some general rules for species with DNF orbitals, but there are also lots of exceptions to these rules that make things more complicated in the later rows of the periodic table. Orbital filling becomes more complicated in periods four through seven. The reason for that is the d orbitals start getting filled in period four, and in period six, we start having f orbitals involved. Now we still adhere to the same general filling rules as before, that is the Aufbau principle, the Pauli exclusion principle, and Hund's rules. However, the smaller energy gaps between the subshells and the subtleties of quantum mechanics mean that there are a lot more nuances and exceptions to the general rule of thumb guidelines compared to what we saw in the first three periods. Let's start off by taking a look at the orbital stability, since those are important for the Aufbau principle. Generally speaking, the energy increases with the quantum numbers n and l. We saw that before for the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p orbitals. As we get to higher orbitals, however, things get a little more complicated. It turns out, for example, that the 4s orbital is lower in energy than the 3d orbital, as highlighted here. The same holds true for the 5s and 4d orbitals. And when we get even further on and f orbitals become involved, it gets even more complicated. The 6s is below the 4f, which is below the 5d. And the same holds true in the next period. The 7s is below the 5f, which is below the 6d. You can see all of these in this energy diagram here. Now this can be difficult to remember, but there's a helpful mnemonic device that can make it easier. To use this, what you do is you write across each row the different possible orbitals for each principal quantum number. So I have the 1s, I have the 2s and 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, etc. n equals 4 shell, n equals 5 shell, and so on. And I've aligned my s, p, d, and f orbitals in columns. Now, I draw diagonal down arrows through each of these, and this determines the sequence of orbitals. So I get 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s, etc., and this reproduces this energy ordering here. Now, as we'll see, this sequence of orbitals is a good starting point, but there are still a number of nuances and exceptions that are going to complicate this further as we get into specific examples of electron configurations. Let's start looking at the orbital filling for period four. Recall that argon here has all its subshells filled up through 3p. So when we come to potassium, the first element in period four, we're going to start filling the 4s orbital because that's the next lowest energy orbital. So potassium has an argon 4s1 configuration. With calcium, we have two valence electrons, so we end up with a 4s2 configuration. When we get to scandium, we now have three valence electrons, so we put two in the 4s orbital, and our next one goes into the 3d. And then for titanium and vanadium, we continue adding them into the 3d orbitals according to Hund's rules, spreading them out with parallel spins. Following these rules, you might expect then that chromium would have a configuration like this, a 4s2, 3d4. However, it turns out this is wrong. Chromium is the first exception to our rules of thumb. In fact, both groups six and 11 elements are special cases. So recall that the 4s and 3d orbitals actually lie quite close in energy. It turns out there's a special stability gain by having a half-filled d shell that's greater than the energy cost required to promote an electron from the 4s to the 3d orbital in chromium. So whereas vanadium has a 4s2 3d3 configuration, chromium actually has a 4s1 3d5 configuration to obtain that half full 3d shell. It's not a 4s2 3d4. There are similar benefits to be gained for a completely full 3d shell. So for copper in group 11, instead of having a 4s2 3d9, which you might expect since it's adjacent to nickel, which has a 4s2 3d8, you end up with a 4s1 
3D10 configuration. Here's a summary of the electron configurations for period 4. So for calcium and potassium, we fill the electrons in the 4s orbital. Once we get to scandium through zinc, we start filling the 3d orbitals, and for the most part, it follows Hund's rules, with the exception, however, of chromium and copper, in which cases we promote one of the 4s electrons to the 3d in order to either get the half-filled or completely filled shell. Now, fortunately, once we get to gallium, and the other elements of the 4p block, things behave pretty normally. In fact, they behave just like the elements in the 2p and 3p blocks earlier. Now, period 5 behaves basically the same as period 4, except we're filling the 5s, 4d, and 5p orbitals instead of the 4s, 3d, and 4p ones. Let's try a practice problem. What is the electron configuration for cobalt, which is right here, element 27? Attempt this problem and hit resume on the video when you're ready to hear the solution. Okay, so cobalt has nine valence electrons. We're going to start off putting the first two in the 4s orbitals, which will leave seven for the 3d. And so we end up with a 4s2, 3d7 valence configuration on top of an argon core. Let's try another one. What's the electron configuration for molybdenum, element 42 in group six? Again, pause the video and hit resume when you're ready for the solution. So molybdenum is like chromium. It has six valence electrons. Naively, you might expect it to have a 5s2, 4d4 configuration, but that's not correct because we get this special stability by having the half filled 4d shell so we promote one electron from the 5s up to the 4d to give us a 5s1, 4d5 configuration. Let's try a third one. What's the electron configuration for silver, which is right here in group 11? Again, pause, attempt the question, and resume when ready. All right, so silver has 11 valence electrons. This is another one of these special cases. Naively, you might expect it to have a 5s2, 4d9 configuration, but instead it promotes one of those s electrons to the d shell to give us a completely full 4d shell and leaving us with a 5s1, 4d10. So this one is analogous to copper. Once we get to period six and seven, we have to start worrying about the f orbitals. Based on the energetic stabilities of these orbitals that we talked about earlier, you'd expect to fill the 6s, then the 4f, then 5d, then 6p in period 6, and in period 7 you'd have the 7s, 5f, 6d, then finally 7p. However, there are lots of exceptions in this part of the periodic table. So starting off with cesium and barium, things are behaving well. We have a 6s1 and a 6s2. For lanthanum, based on this, you'd expect that the next electron would go into the 4f orbital, but actually it turns out to go into the 5d. On the other hand, cerium now fits the original pattern again where we have a 6s2, 4f2 configuration. And now across the lanthanides, we generally start filling the f orbitals in a pretty systematic fashion. Except you'll notice, for example, in element 64, instead of having a 6s2, 4f8 configuration, we maintain the half-filled shell and put one electron in the d orbital, and so on. Once we've filled the f's, in general though, we then start filling the d's and then eventually the p's. In period seven, things get even messier. The first two elements behave similarly, so does element 89 with a 7s2, 6d1. So you might expect in element 90 that it would have a 7s2, 5f2 configuration, but instead it has a 6d2. And here you see we have a mixture of electrons in the f and d orbitals. So in other words, things just start getting really complicated. The rules we've talked about are useful for giving you a rough idea of what the electron configurations are in this part of the periodic table, but you often will need to verify with a diagram like this in order to see what the actual configurations are for an element. Let's try a couple practice problems. And none of these are gonna be crazy exceptions. These are gonna to adhere to the general filling rules. So what is the electron configuration for tantalum, element 73, which appears right here on the periodic table? Pause the video, attempt the solution, and hit resume when ready. 
Okay, so tantalum has the 6s orbitals filled. We've also gone completely through the lanthanides, meaning we filled the 4f shells, and we have one, two, three electrons that can go into the d orbitals. So we expect a 6s2, 4f14, 5d3 configuration. That and that is in fact the correct answer. Let's try another one. What is the electron configuration for europium element 63? All right, in this case, we have a filled 6s, and then we've started filling the 4s, and we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons into that, so we expect a 6s2, 4f7 configuration. And then we filled, again, the f's before the d's, so it's not a 5d7, it's a 4f7. In general, the lanthanide and actinides down here fill the f electrons. In summary, orbital filling becomes more complicated once we reach period four, because we start dealing with D and F electrons. The typical filling order follows the relative energy stabilities that you can determine from this mnemonic device. However, there are a number of exceptions. We saw, for example, how in cases like chromium or copper, you can promote an electron from the S orbital to the D orbital to get either a half filled or completely filled D shell. Once you get down to the last two periods where f orbitals are involved, you have all sorts of exceptions and it's often necessary to then look up the configurations to confirm what you might guess based on these rules of thumb. So again, just to reiterate, it's important to remember that these rules are useful rules of thumb that work most of the time, but they are imperfect. Sometimes you actually need to do the quantum mechanics to determine the reality of the electron configuration for a given element.